Hello and welcome to Keep Talking, a community dialogue about mental health. My name is Gay Maxwell. I'm the manager of the Office of Continuing Education at the Brattleboro Retreat. The Brattleboro Retreat is a 181-year-old hospital in southeastern Vermont. It serves children, adolescents, and adults in a variety of inpatient, outpatient, and residential settings. The Brattleboro Retreat provides care and courage when being human hurts. Today on our episode of Keep Talking, I'm thrilled to have Dr. Frank Anderson with me today. Um, Dr. Anderson, you will be presenting tomorrow to almost 100 mental health professionals from all over New England who have come to see you, and you'll be talking about psycho uh, psychotherapy and its relationship to psychopharmacology and vice versa. That's right. right. Um, and so I thought it would be such a great idea to have you on uh, today to talk about um, that to the Keep Talking audience. What mm -hmm. does that mean? A lot of people feel like the whole world of medication is very mysterious and right. kind of scary. So it'd be nice to, to talk about that today. Mm -hmm. um, but I just want to say a few things about yourself, and maybe you, and please chime in if I'm leaving anything out. Um, you are you did your residency at Harvard Medical School. Mm -hmm. You're a psychiatrist. Um, you have a private practice in Concord, Mass., mm -hmm. right? And also, you are the chairman of the Foundation of Self Leadership, yes. and that's and can you explain a little bit about that? Sure, sure. So um, the Foundation for Self Leadership is now is about two years old, um, and it's affiliated with kind of a parent organization called the Center for Self-Leadership. And it's a form of therapy um, that's kind of growing wildly throughout the country um, called Internal Family Systems. Ah, uh, yes. Okay, so IFS is what it's called. And the foundation was um, formed to kind of validate this IFS model to help bring it beyond psychotherapy and into the community. And so I've been sharing that for a couple of years, which has been really wonderful and a lot of fun. Um, and um, just recently, like within the past month or so, uh, this form of IFS therapy that is actually integrated in a lot of what I'm going to talk about tomorrow, actually. Mm -hmm. This is part of how I put these two worlds together of psychotherapy and psychopharmacology. Mm -hmm. um, just became an evidence-based treatment, which is just wonderful news. What does that mean exactly, an evidence-based treatment? Yeah. So there's this whole governing board to validate psychotherapy, um, to say what's legitimate, what has research behind it, because one of the things that's kind of different about psychotherapy compared to other forms of medicine um, is it's pretty um, ununiformed. Okay, the, the example that I like to use a lot is that if somebody has a, a virus or a bacterial infection, they can test which antibiotic works, and then they give the medication, and the, the disease goes away. Psychotherapy is very different. It's much more vague and nebulous and kind of harder to figure out what exactly works. So there's a lot of different forms of psychotherapy out there to help people um, with what they're struggling with around mental health issues. So this idea of um, formalizing it, legitimizing it, proving its, its efficacy is mm -hmm. something that's really important. So when a treatment does become evidence-based, it's a huge piece around its, its validity um, and something that people can seek out saying, hey, I want this kind of treatment because I understand that there's proof that it and works. And it's called again? Internal family systems. Internal family systems yeah. therapy. Yeah. So you are a psychiatrist who also does psychotherapy. That's right. And now, yeah. are you, is that a common thing now? <laughs> no, it is not. It really isn't. Tell me a little bit about that. Yeah, it's, and it's one of the reasons that I picked the residency that I picked, was that it was a residency program that offered both learn how to do therapy and learn medication management. Unfortunately for me, most psychiatric residency programs now are all about medicine. Okay, it's all about brain science and receptors, which don't get me wrong, is important. But it also doesn't teach people how to be with people and how to talk to people and how to do therapy. So I've always, I'm a people person. I love I talking to people. <laughs> it's not that I, obvious, I, no, huh? It's not. I can't tell. <laughs> and so I, it was natural fit for me to just to be able to speak to people, talk to them, learn what was going on inside of their head beyond receptors and medication. So it was important for me to learn how to do therapies. Well, let me ask you this. Um, 
uh, as, as I said, I want to focus a little on, on how psychotherapy and, and yes. psychopharmacology go together. Mm -hmm. And I, I guess, I gather it was in the 1990s that the Food and Drug Administration said, we're going to relax all these regulations on the pharmaceutical companies uh, about mm -hmm. advertising. We're going to let them broadcast on television. <clears throat> we're going to let them broadcast in, on the internet. Yes. And pretty soon, we all became, if we turned on the, any kind of screen, inundated yes. by these advertisements um, recommending uh, all kinds of drugs to make you feel better. And <laughs> so that if you are somebody who might be sitting at home suffering from anxiety, uh, panic disorder, depression, phobias, there's there's a drug company out there who's marketing a pill to you, you or it. something. That's right. Um, and so, uh, and they're telling you, ask your doctor, That's ask right. your doctor. So a lot of people are going into their doctor's office saying, there's a pill that makes me feel better. Right. I want to take it. Um, why would you say it's important to get a psychiatric evaluation instead of just going to your general practitioner? Yeah. Well, let me speak to two things about that. One is this whole idea of commercials, for me mental health commercials. I think they're hysterical, they honestly. Like, uh, I've had people come into my office and say, oh, I'd like to take Abilify, for example. I'm like, oh, really? Why? <laughs> well, because it was on TV. Great. What's it for? I don't know. It's, you know, the, the way they do these commercials is, for me, it's Well, there's kind of usually ridiculous. a butterfly somewhere. It's always a the butterfly <laughs> or a nice scenic background like we have here. Yes. And this sense of well-being. They don't really say exactly what they're for, mm -hmm. okay? Because oftentimes medications are for more than one disorder. So they can't pinpoint, ask this for depression. You want to feel better. You want to feel happier. You want to be lighter. Mm -hmm. Ask for Abilify or Prozac or whatever. I'm not going to pick on Abilify. It's just mm -hmm. one that's really heavily commercialized, you know. Yes. And so it kind of, separate from all the list of horrible side effects <laughs> that they have to list on TV, which is kind of funny. That's this happens funny on too. the radio also. Yes. Flatulence, diarrhea, <laughs> vomiting. Take this pill, you'll feel better. better. You know what I mean? <laughs> so I, I think it's kind of crazy because it, they can't be specific enough that's really helpful. Mm -hmm for someone to say, oh, geez, maybe that could work for me. So it's too general. And it's, I don't think it's helpful. I think it's all about marketing. And, it, it, you know, I will say there was one time I don't meet with any drug companies because oftentimes these drug reps come for marketing purposes. And I'll never forget the time they gave me some pens or a cup. And somebody came into my office, and I often give people a decision and a choice. I say, choose them. You know, I educate, you decide. This is my philosophy, mm -hmm. okay? Very equalizing, this mm -hmm. power differential. Mm -hmm. And somebody chose Prozac. Uh, I gave them this range of options, and she later said to me in a follow-up visit that I chose it because you had a cup on your desk that said Prozac, and I thought you liked it better than the other ones you offered me. And it was in that moment, I was like, I am not going to do that. I'm not going to buy into marketing to treat mental health. It just isn't something that's important. Or it, I was just so struck by that, that it really works in that way, which sways people to maybe take something that's not in their best interest, to ask for a pill that doesn't, isn't even relevant for them, that they think is going to help them. So say someone goes to their primary care physician, their, yeah. their general protect, practitioner, and, the, and says, I want to take this drug. And the doctor says, well, I think you should get a psychiatric evaluation. Right. That's Does right. that mean, do, is that bad news? No, not at all. And, you know, um, it's really useful because um, it's not a bad thing. There's a lot of stigma mm -hmm. around mental health as mm -hmm. a reality, okay? Mm -hmm. And we have to deal with that stigma. Everybody does. But um, the point for me if you go to your general doctor, and it, you know, oftentimes there isn't enough psychiatrists around, okay? They're at high demand. There's not enough for, to serve people's needs. So oftentimes internists will pitch in mm -hmm. and give somebody a medication, okay, to help them with depression or anxiety or whatever they're struggling with. But they're not experts in this field, okay? And I don't want to slam or say anything negative about an internist, okay? The, the example that I make with that I could prescribe you a high blood pressure medicine 
okay? Because I know enough. I, generally, I know about them. I remember that from medical school and my residency. But it would be just that. It would be a general treatment because I'm not up on what's current, on what's latest. I don't know the doses in a way around those medications. So, you know, kind of a, an internist prescribing something for anxiety is like me, a psychiatrist prescribing something for high blood pressure that, you, you know, they know a general amount, but they don't know specifics. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, it's not their field of expertise. Okay. And sometimes they're forced into treating people just because there isn't enough psychiatrists around or the need is there. So I don't, uh, you know, if you're struggling, go get help. If it's complicated, go to a psychiatrist. You know, sometimes an internist can do basic stuff around mental health issues, and it's fine. If I've got got the nerve to go to a psychiatrist's office, what, and I'm sitting out there in the waiting room, what should I expect? For a psychiatrist? um, So a couple things. Um, First of all, one of the things that I do with people is to help them understand what a medication would actually do for them, okay? Um, so, for, for example, and I don't know if this is quite answering your question, so if I'm not, let me know. I'll come back. Okay, wonderful, great. So, uh, you know, people don't know what to ask for because they don't really know what meds are supposed to do. Okay, so the way that I think about it, so what do I do if I go into a psychiatrist's office? What do I expect? Okay, and I do a lot of education around this. And this is partly what I'll be doing tomorrow with a bunch of mental health providers is to help therapists also help clients to determine what I need to ask for. What is, what am I supposed to expect? Medications don't treat feelings. They treat symptoms. Okay, so if you're sad, don't take a pill. Okay, if you're depressed and you're not motivated and you can't eat, you're trouble functioning. Those are symptoms. Those are symptoms, and those are what medications help with. Okay, the loneliness, we don't have a pill for that, despite what the commercials <laughs> may tell you. Mm-hmm. Okay, so we're not treating feelings. We're treating symptoms that get in the way of functioning. And for me, that's a really important distinction, okay? That medications are there to treat symptoms and to help people, what are the symptoms that I have? What am I struggling with, okay? So a good psychiatric interview would be something that would parse out the symptoms from the feelings. Yes. Would parse that out and to, to, to... uh, to weigh what what it is that you might need from a medication. Yeah, what a medication could actually help with. Yes. Okay, a lot of people worry that medications, I don't want to take a medicine, it's going to change my personality. I was going to ask you okay. about that. <laughs> I was going to get there. Yeah, a lot of people are worried about that. It's a legitimate fear, you know. And, and I'll say this, um, sometimes medications, when they're not dosed correctly, do alter people in a way that isn't helpful, okay? And this is one of the things that, and I'm not, again, I don't want to trash or say anything negative about internists, but sometimes internists will hand somebody 20 milligrams of Prozac. That may be way too much for that person, Mm -hmm. okay? Because everybody's different, okay? And everybody needs a different dose. And an average dose for one person may not be an average dose for another person. So 20 milligrams of Prozac for some person can be too much. And then they feel numb and detached, and like in a fog. Mm-hmm. And so they're over-medicated, and they don't feel like themselves. That's not helpful, okay? Medications in the right dose should make you feel back to who you are, okay? What are the questions that a patient should be asking a psychiatrist in an evaluation. There's a tendency, I think, for us to, yeah. you talked about the power differential totally. before, totally. for so, the patient to sit back and say, okay, you're doing this to me, you know, right. but yeah. what, what questions should a patient ask? It's, it's one of the things that really frustrates me about the medical world. I mean, it's one of the things I'll talk about um, tomorrow. Um, in medical school, you're taught your the doctor, you know what's best. It's your job to tell this person what's best for them. Mm-hmm. Okay. I did a lot of unlearning of that when I became a psychiatrist and a therapist. 
okay? It's more about tell me what's going on for you. Tell me what you're struggling with. I'll educate you around what, these, what meds are available and you make a choice, mm -hmm. okay? So this is for me why um, the, it's not so much the questions that a client should ask the psychiatrist. It's more like, this is what I'm struggling with. The question may be, what is available for me? What are my options? Mm -hmm. Okay, instead of this idea, I'll tell you what's best for you. Here's the prescription. Go take it. That's, That's a very good way to put it. The, what are my options? What are my options? What are my choices? What are my options? If I choose this one... What are the benefits? What are the side effects? Mm -hmm. It should be a choice. When I work with people, there, isn't, there are no compliance issues. People aren't doing what I say to do. They're taking a medicine because they want to. They're, t they're wanting help with these symptoms and they know which side effects they could get. If they decide not to take it, it's my job to teach them how to go off of it safely. Not to convince them to take it because I think they should. It's really a choice. You had mentioned before that, that uh, I won't feel by, uh, like myself. There yes. are a number of things that people struggle mm -hmm. with when they, when they think about taking medication. Right. Um, one, of uh, one of which is medication is a crutch. It's a, yeah. um, I'm going to get to, you know, I, yeah. I should have enough willpower to get over this. Yeah. This is where biology is important. Okay, and I have a slide, and well, yeah, I could show it up here if I had. All nerve cells communicate via chemicals. Every, we have trillions of nerve cells in our brain. They all communicate with each other through chemicals. Okay, that's the way our brain communicates. There's electrical activity, and then there's chemicals between one nerve cell and the next. Okay, that's biology. If your chemicals are imbalanced, either too much or too little, your brain's not functioning the way it's supposed to, the normal way, okay? So medicines increase or decrease the amount of the chemical. That's it. So, you know, you can't will yourself more dopamine or will yourself more serotonin, for example. It's a chemical imbalance. There's a reality to that biology, okay? Life circumstances can affect our biology. So if you're lost your job, got a divorce, something traumatic or tragic happens in your life, your chemicals can get imbalanced. Mm. And that's a really important piece for people to know. Yeah. Will is not going to change that. Mm. We're such a culture of will, though. That's of exactly self -will. right. Let's see. There, and, you know, I'm not going to say medications are the only option. There are some studies that compare meditation to medication. There are, sub there are studies that compare exercise to medication. You know what I mean? It's not the only way, but it's a way, okay? And try what diet affects our mood, okay? There's a lot of people that are kind of addicted to carbohydrates that get into these sugar highs and these crashes. And it can kind of mimic a bipolar up and down mood swing kind of picture. And that's all nutritionally based. So you can get a lot of things, a lot of things in our life can affect our mood. Mm -hmm. But when your chemicals are out of whack and it, you're trying things and it's not working, there's a way to readjust the chemicals to bring them back to the normal level. What do you tell people who worry about, uh, who say, I'm worried I'm going to get addicted. I'll get addicted to these drugs. Yeah, I worry about that too under certain circumstances because there are a handful of meds that are addictive. Okay. Which are those? Um, the benzodiazepines mostly. Clonopin, Valium, Xanax, Ativan. That group is addictive. Some sleeping medicines are also addictive. Ambien, Sonata, Lunesta. And yeah, I, I'm a big fan of not getting anybody addicted to anything. For example, for me, with a benzodiazepine, which is really great for short-term anxiety... But short term. Short term. Yeah. I never give more than 15 pills per month. Mm -hmm. So that's no, that you can't even take them every day. You can't get addicted to them. Okay? So most addictive substances are good for short term use. 
It's when people give lots of them is when the trouble comes in. And that happens, unfortunately, more than we want to think. That's what you hear. It really does. And people can buy them on the internet. They can buy them off the street. So addictive medicines are not helpful. But most psychiatric medicines are not addictive. Is that true? Yeah. Most antidepressants are not addictive. Uh, most meds for mood stabilization or bipolar disorder, or schizophrenia, uh, anxiety, most of those meds are not addictive. Hmm. So that's what it's you would It's important for people to know it that. It is important for people yeah. to know. And to give, if you're giving an addictive substance, to educate somebody about it, okay? It also, sometimes internists or inpatient settings use those benzodiazepines a lot because in the short term, they really help people calm down. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Just don't let them walk out of the office with five a day with five refills. How about the people that say to you, um, this is, you're going to cut me off from my creativity. I, w I won't be yes. creative anymore. <laughs> this is going to make, make me a kind of zombie and I, I, I won't be able Got to it. write my novel and I, w or I won't be able to dance. <clears throat> It's a really good point, okay? And the reason I'm laughing is because <laughs> at one point I was a psychiatrist for Berklee College of Music mm -hmm. in Boston, and they were a wonderful group of, you know, young, creative students, okay? So I heard that all the time. I'm not going to be able to make my music, you know? And here's, here's interestingly what I would do with folks like that. Say, so tell me what substances you do use, <laughs> okay? Pot ecstasy, alcohol, you know, who, which alter and enhance their creativity in this way that's artificial, okay? Mm -hmm. And there's this belief system that that will help my creativity when it's altered. It's mind-altering and it's abusive substances, mm -hmm. okay? And when I have that discussion with them, they, oh, you don't want me to alter your creativity, but you're doing that on a daily basis, mm -hmm. right? Tell me about that. So when we have the discussion and I educate people, the medicines don't do that, mm -hmm. okay? They don't alter your creativity. If they do, you're on the wrong medicine or it's the wrong dose. The medicines should make you feel like yourself again. I can't tell you how many people who come in and are depressed or anxious take a medication and say, oh yeah, I'm myself again. I remember this. I remember this because depression is insidious, meaning it's slow growing. It happens over time. So people get into this lull of being depressed and they forget who they really are. Meds bring us back to who we are not who we should be mm -hmm. or want to be. Mm -hmm. Let me ask you this. I know that from studying the materials that you are including uh, for the mental health professionals tomorrow, yeah. that one of the things that you are very clear about is I want, you, you, what I guess I, I'm quoting you, I want to be a, make sure that the client is 100% yes. on board before I write that prescription. That's great. And wh why, why is that? Yeah, and, and this is where the IFS work that I talked about earlier is so important because... The internal family systems. Exactly. Yes. That internal family systems say we all have parts of us. We all have parts, okay? A part of me is sitting here talking to you right now. A part of me goes and plays with my kids when I'm home. You know, a part of me exercises and loves to be an athlete. We all have different aspects of ourselves, okay? And when you're taking a medication, for me, in order for me to give you a medication, I want to be 100% sure that all parts of you are on board with taking this medicine, mm -hmm. okay? And that's what I mean when I say 100% of you needs to be on board with this. A, a classic example I'll give you is somebody will say, I have a terrible time sleeping, give me a sleep medicine. Okay, fine, here's a sleep medicine, let me tell you about the dosage, take the prescription and go. They come back in and say, this medicine's not working. Oh, really? That's interesting. So you raise the dose, you give another one, it's still not working, it's still not working. What happens to me in those circumstances, and I've just learned this the hard way, is that nobody's asking the client in total, tell me all of your feelings about this medicine, mm -hmm. okay? Because what you'll hear if you ask, there's a part of me that's desperately wanting to sleep. And there's a part of me that's terrified of going to sleep mm. because of what happened to me when I was young as a child. So I have to be vigilant and I can't let her sleep. 
okay? And so you have a conflict inside where a part of you is exhausted and a part of you is terrified to sleep. So if you don't come to some terms internally with that dilemma, the meds aren't going to work. And this may sound crazy, and I'll use that word in quotes. Parts of us that don't want the meds to work block the effect of the meds. Mm -hmm. It really happens. And I've heard this. And when you start asking those questions, you start hearing things like that. It's fascinating to me. I don't know any studies about this. But I see but that's it all been your the time. Yeah. I've had some, another person, another example of this. I'm so depressed. I want an antidepressant. Okay, fine. Give an antidepressant. Somebody comes in for a consultation. It's not working. It's not working. It's not working. Okay. Why isn't it working? Let's get curious. Okay. So then the person kind of goes inside and starts listening to all the different feelings, all the different thoughts inside. This is not... I'm not talking about Sybil here. I'm talking about all of our feelings about it. And the person here is, wow, there's a part of me that says every time I become undepressed, I go out, I meet somebody, I go on dates, and I get hurt all over again. Mm -hmm. And that part of me doesn't want to get, keep getting hurt. So it doesn't want me to be undepressed because it doesn't want me to get hurt again. Mm -hmm. And I say, wow, that's really important. Let that part of you know we're not going to give a medicine unless it agrees. We want to hear from it. We want to hear its concerns. We want all of you to be on board. And guess what? There's no compliance issues. People take the medicines when they fully want to take them. We work through any conflicts that they have about it. The stigma is one that comes up a lot. Mm -hmm. If I take it, I'm going to be defective. Well, we have to work with the part of you that feels defective before you take a medicine. Mm -hmm. Because when it says, okay, you're not going to change me, you're not going to alter me, then it'll be willing to take the medicine, and the meds are much more likely to be effective. This is one of these things that I have really found in my career that is not being taught in residency programs, I'll tell you that. But you'll be teaching it tomorrow. I will be teaching it tomorrow, and it is one of my missions. It really is, is to teach this, you know, to people, to, to people who are, you know, do I want this, do I not want this? You know, do I go in, do I not go in for, you know, to an office visit? You know what I mean? So this is, that you're showing examples, or you've been giving some examples of, the f of, of working with the feelings, you as opposed it. to working with the symptoms. That's exactly. And that's, and that's what the psychotherapy is about. That's I mean, right. there, I, I wonder what you tell people when they say, well, you know, like I've got the pill and that'll fix everything. Yeah. It's a quick fix. Uh, why should I go in for navel gazing? Yeah. Why should I care if my gym yeah. teacher called me fat when I was, you know, three and I've never wanted to exercise again. I mean, what, yep. what, why should I care about that stuff? For me, medications are therapy enhancers, mm. not replacers. Mm -hmm. Okay. And as I said before, medicines don't fix feelings. Okay. So if you're struggling in your life, a pill is not going to fix that. The pills, the medications help adjust the chemicals. So you decrease your symptoms. It actually enables you to work on your life, to improve your life, to make the changes you need to make, which is what therapy helps with. Mm -hmm. Okay? So it, it's not a replacer. Sometimes people do say, I feel better because I'm, I'm, I have more motivation, I have more energy, but they haven't worked through the difficulties and the, and the struggles that prevent them from making the changes they need to make in their life. The meds make it easier, actually, to make the changes in your life because you're not bogged down by sleep trouble, lack of motivation, suicidal feelings, or crippling anxiety. Mm -hmm. It gets rid of the symptoms so it allows you to do the things you need to do. And that's where therapy helps. And that's where one's creativity could actually blossom. Totally. Totally. Absolutely. Yeah. Because right. the symptoms block it. Mm -hmm. Not, you know. So it sounds like you're a proponent of of being open to both those, totally. both those of, of of psychotherapy and psychopharmacology, Absolutely. if yeah. if need be. That's why I do both. That's why you do both. And there's many, many studies that say people get better the most with both. Mm -hmm. 
to take, you know, studies on psychotherapy alone, studies on medication alone. Have God. you noticed for yourself, just getting back to the pharmaceutical industry, yes. that there's been a big uptick in psychopharmacol? I mean, drug taking as opposed to psychotherapy, has it hurt psychotherapy? It's really a complicated issue. I do think there's, you know, I wrote an article in The Networker, which is a, 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 a magazine for psychotherapists, on this dilemma because there's a big chasm in the mental health field. Mm -hmm. The psychiatrists who give the meds and the therapists who do the therapy. And, you know, they kind of are at odds with each other in a way, which is kind of a problem. It would be much better when they work much together better. and when they work collaboratively. Um, but, you know, part of the problem with it is that the psychopharm industry pushes it. The insurance companies want things that are quick so insurance companies endorse meds more than they endorse therapy. Mm -hmm. And they pay higher rates for meds than they do for therapy. Mm -hmm. You know? And so there develops this tension within them which isn't helpful. Mm -hmm. You know, people would be able to do psychotherapy much go fewer visits if they took meds and they were feeling better. Mm -hmm. So if they if you work collaborative, collaboratively together it would be more efficient and cost effective um, for people to be able to do both instead of one better than the other. What do you say to people who worry, I'll be on this for the rest of my life? Would do, is, is, uh, will these pills cure me or will I be on, on, yeah. on this for the rest of my it's, life? It's variable. So some people will need them for the rest of their lives under certain conditions. You know, For example, right now, bipolar disorder is one of those um, conditions that if the medicine works and it prevents you from going into episodes, yes, you need to take it for the rest of your life. Okay, and that's a choice you can make. If I want to not have highs and lows anymore, I choose to take this. I know that if I stop taking that, I'm at risk of getting an episode again. Okay, so bipolar disorder is one of those that we say, yes, that's true. You, want, you don't want to take it? Don't. Mm -hmm. You still have the choice. Yes. Okay. Um, ADD is also another one. Okay, people with ADD, um, even though we're learning now that medications stimulate brain change. So we're learning what's happening with bipolar disorder or attention deficit disorder, which is what ADD is, mm -hmm. is that people are needing lower and lower doses as time goes on because there's real brain change that's happening oh. and there's evidence of that. Mm -hmm. Okay, there are other conditions like depression which most people do not need to take a pill for the rest of their life. You get an episode of depression, you treat that for six months to a year, you taper off the medicine and then you don't need it anymore. Anxiety, similar. If it's anxiety based on life stress, you might need it for a short period of time and then you taper off the medicine and you're fine. And so this is another reason why it might be good to you be working it. with a psychiatrist yes. who has uh, access to this kind of information in another way, that, that's exactly in a different right. way than an internist or a, a general practitioner totally. would have. That's exactly right. To know which ones are you do need to take for how long, which doses, mm -hmm. you know, what are the options. Absolutely. Wow. Well, I want to thank you so much, Dr. Anderson, for coming in and, and, this, and giving your time this way. It's a gift to the Brattleboro community and a gift to the Brattleboro Retreat. And I really look forward to um, working with you tomorrow on your conference. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. And thanks for having me. Oh, I loved it. Yeah, great. And I will close another episode of Keep Talking, a community dialogue about mental health. Thank you so much for joining us. And thank you to BCTV, who does all the work of editing this program and putting it together for us. We couldn't do this without them. Thank you so much for joining us. And come back again for another episode of Keep Talking. Mm -hmm.